Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. Welcome back to Creative Live TV. I'm your host, Kenna Klosterman, and I am coming to you live uh, from my home to your home to wherever it is that you are in the world. Uh, here at Creative Live TV, we bring you experts and photographers, we bring you filmmakers, we bring you musicians, um, all to entertain and inspire. And today we are recording an episode of our We Are Photographers podcast, uh, where again, we bring you photographers, filmmakers, and creative industry game changers, people that we love and you love to really understand the why they do what they do, to understand their personal journeys so that we all know that we are not alone. So for starters, I want to make sure if you are tuning in that you give a shout out, let me know where in the world you are joining from. And uh, we always love to, again, see where the community is all over the world. I'm super excited for today's guest. It's our very first time having her here on Creative Live. Her name is Sharice May, and Sharice is a photographer and an educator. She is a portrait and editorial photographer based out of Washington, D.C. Um, she is the president of the Women Photojournalists of Washington. She is an Adobe education leader. Uh, she's a very sought after speaker, and she is an adjunct professor at Howard University, which is also her alma mater. Uh, her work has appeared in O Magazine, The New York Times, Blue Bloomberg, Time, ABC, The Today Show, and MSNBC, and her work is featured in a permanent exhibit at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Sharice May, welcome to Creative Live. Kenna, thanks for having me today, and everyone who's joined in here at Creative Live. Happy well, to be it, here. It is an honor to have you on, and I want to just dive right in and talk about your sweatshirt because you are um, the founder, which I didn't mention as well, of HBC Soul. And I would love to hear about what that is, why you started it, and yeah, just tell us all about it. Okay, so uh, thank you for asking me. So HBC Soul um, was birthed out of a love for historically black colleges and universities. As Kenna said earlier, I'm an alum of Howard University in Washington, D.C. I'm also an adjunct professor at Howard. Um, this is my 19th year I'm teaching in the School of Communications. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it, it doesn't feel like it's been 19 years, but it's been 19 years. You don't years. look old enough uh, for it to be 19 years, <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take it. I accept that. So, um, HBCU Soul really is, it takes my two loves, my love for storytelling, uh, visual storytelling, and my love for HBCUs. And currently, as far as I know at this point, there are 101 HBCUs that are still in existence. And there were more, but, um, you know, due to different issues of fin financial issues and things like that, we're down to 101 now. So HBCU Soul is exploring the nuances of those who chose to go to an HBCU because we are all connected in some kind of way why we made the decision to attend an HBCU. And so what I wanted to do was to bring attention to the schools, but also celebrate those alum who make up the soul of what HBCUs are. So that was the start of that. I came up with this design and, um, you know, just made some sweatshirts and some t-shirts and everything. And, um, it, it, I took a little, a break from it because I was doing some other work. And so I had to put it on the back burner, but I definitely will be revisiting this project and, um, continuing. So uh I know, because I've heard you speak before, um, that, again, you're 19 years adjunct professor at Howard University, um, went there as a student, uh, and I, I'm curious, what, is it, what does it feel like for you to be teaching at a school and community that, that so shaped you? And can you, can you talk a little bit about what you studied there and um, how that shaped you as who you are today? Sure. So um, it feels like coming home. That's that's what it feels like. So initially, when I first started um, teaching, I taught at the University of Maryland College Park. 
And so I taught there at University of Maryland College Park in their um, school of communications, a newspaper production and design class. And that was during a time when I first started working at the Washington Post um, as a graphic designer in sports. So I started out in graphic design and that goes to like my background at Howard. Um, I was an advertising major and I was an electronic studio minor, which is pretty much graphic design. And my, when I went to school, my plans were to work in creative services at an ad agency. I thought that's what I would be doing, but I was always taking pictures on the side. Like that was a hobby that became like a stronger hobby and it just kept my love for it kept growing. But at Howard, um, so I left the University of Maryland College Park as an adjunct to accept a position to teach at Howard. And so, like I said earlier, it was like coming home. And I just, surreal, sometimes it still is surreal when I'm walking the halls, the same halls that I walked as a student, that I'm now walking as a professor there is, it's interesting. And like, sometimes it's funny because you said like, well, you don't look like you've been teaching 19 years. And so I've had some incident, incidences where I've been like early to my class and, and, you know, I've been sitting there and the students are talking, like waiting for the class. They're like, yeah, so what have you heard about this class? Or, you know, yeah, I heard da, da, da. And they're just like talking. They don't know I'm the professor. And so <laughs> we, once the, you know, the class starts and I go in and, you know, I go to the, to the desk at the top and start, you know, putting stuff on the board. They were like, oh, you're the professor. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm the professor. So um, it's, it's really, um, it's something that I really enjoy doing because I feel like I'm going back to the place where I got my, my start and my growth um, in the woman and, you know, the photographer and, you know, pretty much a lot of what I do started um, at Howard. So Howard was like that, you know, during college, you come into your own and you figure out like, you know, what things you're passionate about and, you know, what kind of things are you, you're, you're interested that you're going to do career wise, like once you leave school. So Howard is like, like those formative years of, you know, you've left home, you're out of the nest and you're having to make decisions and become the woman, man, you know, that you know, that you are. So to come back to that and be able to pour into the students where I once sat is, um, it's amazing. Like I, I really do love it. Um, it's something that I guess, obviously I love it because this is the 19th year, but I feel like I learned a lot about, um, my connection to my culture, my heritage, Um, and I form like those strong values and opinions and, and things like that, which have shaped the way I look at things, the way I look at the world, the way I approach, um, photography even. So it's, it's a beautiful experience. It really is. And what would you say is the way that you see the world, the way that you approach photography? So I think a lot of that has to do with my strong advocation for diverse storytelling, because at Howard, you know, being a historically black college and university, um, but it wasn't, there were other students that went there as well. So being a black college and university, there were also other students who came from other countries. You know, I had some white students in my class. Um, I've taught, you know, I've had some, some of those students as being a student and as a professor, you know, that I've had um, experiences with. But for me, it's, it's that connection to the culture. And what it shaped in me was to really look at and learn about these, um, you know, my ancestors and those who came, those who came before me who are great innovators, who are um, doing a lot of things uh, in the past. You know, some of them are no longer here with us, their ancestors, but some of them are still living to this day and they've made so many inroads in everything from A to Z. So what it instilled in me was that kind of passion and that confidence that 
I could do anything that I wanted to do. And if someone says no, there's always another way, or maybe that's not for me. But I think what it really did show me was to not be afraid to strike out there and do what I was passionate about. And to have that connection to my culture and my roots and things like that just made me even stronger in saying, you know what, these stories need to be told and we need these different voices. We need, it, it shouldn't be like a homogenous um, situation where you're only hearing one side of the story or stories are only being told from that one side. So what Howard taught me was to have that confidence and to go out there and tell that story. So I, there's, there's an image of yours that stands out uh, and it's um, a little girl holding a sign that says, I think it's justice for my ancestors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm curious if you can talk about you know, how right now it is uh, September 2020. Um, we are in the midst of a crazy year, <laughs> uh, yeah. to say the least. Um, how has your approach to covering Black Lives Matter protests, to covering social injustices that are happening right now, um, how has being a Black woman photographer, photojournalist, um, and we can talk in a minute about um, about the lack of diversity in photojournalism. Mm -hmm. um, but how has that approach to your storytelling um, been unique in the way that you are capturing portraits and such? I, again, like that individual picture is so powerful. So for me, I think it's, it's very important. And it's a lot of the reason why I chose to go out there and to not stay in. Um, to go out there, and I'll say this, you'll hear me say this often, is I'm shooting from the lens of a Black woman. So all of my experiences, uh, personal experiences, family and friends experiences, life experiences, all of that comes into play. Like, we're not robotic. So when, I'm, when I go out there, a lot of times, like, I'll say that I see myself in protesters. I see myself in it because I, I live it. Like that's my life, that's my experience. So some of the same issues and the things that people, the justices and the injustices they're fighting against and the justices they're fighting for are the same things that are important to me and my family and my friends and my community. So all of that plays into when I go out there, what I connect with and what I see. So from the lens of a black woman, when I'm out there, all of that is is in my thinking so that when I approach, and this is this is really my approach even beyond the protest, is to, without even taking a picture first, just to go and just look around and experience and see what's going on and get a feel for the emotion, the mood, um, you know, just look around me. Because I think sometimes we'll pick up our cameras and we'll be so focused on the technical aspects of it that we miss a lot of things that go on around us. And I tend to gravitate to those quiet moments and those stories that aren't so like in your face. And especially like if there's a lot going on at one time, I, I look at and I gravitate to those quiet moments that are happening at the same time. And so you'll see like in a lot of my images, it's those like kind of sensitive, quiet moments to me that speak so powerfully. So the little girl with the sign, justice for my ancestors, you know, that's just one of the things when I, when I saw that and she's holding this sign and I think she's maybe like four, three or four years old. And to be out there in the, not only the weight of what that sign represents, but the actual weight of the sign for this tiny little girl. So to me, it spoke very loudly on, you know, the gravity of what's going on, you know, out there. And I think a lot of times, like I'm, I'm not big on 
I guess I have an issue with helicopter journalism. And so one of my things is when you have journalists, whether photojournalists, reporters, editors, whoever, who may come into a community during a kind of sensational time where emotions are high, but you're not there before that and you're not there after that. And that's where I think it, there's an issue. So me coming in as a Black woman, it's like, I feel that. I feel that myself. I, you know, I feel that personally. So I want to be cognizant of telling that full story. What happened before this? Why is this happening? Then you're there during. And then what happens after? Because there's going to be a time where people just go back to, you know, wherever they live, their own communities. And then that community is left to pick up the pieces. So it's, I think it's very important. And like, like I was saying earlier, that's why I feel a responsibility as a Black woman to, to use my lens to go out there and tell that full story. First of all, I think this the concept of the, the quiet strength is beautiful. Um, and your ability, as I see in your images, you know, to see, experience, and feel that. I mean, as a as a you know, portrait you, within your journalism, there's a lot of you know that portraiture where you are clearly you know connecting with that subject, um, and which I think is is sort of at the, the heart of visual storytelling, like the ability to tell a story in a single image, you know, especially as a, as a journalist, you know, maybe there's features where there's multiple images, but, mm -hmm. you know, that ability to tell, use one person in one instance to tell that much bigger story. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you are the president of, um, the Women Photojournalists of Washington, WPOW, which I love. <laughs> and um, I, I want to talk about opportunity. And I mean, we're talking about uh, you being a Black woman photojournalist and the importance of telling the narrative from your point of view. What um, is WPOW and what have you been working on what, during your time there? Okay. So Women Photojournalists of Washington, also known as WAPOW, and the logo looks exactly like WAPOW. Uh, it is an organization that advocates for um, women photojournalists, and it's, it's based here in D.C., but we do have another chapter in New York right now. Um, and what it is is the founders saw a need for this, this need for advocation and change in the industry that is heavily white male dominated. So what WAPOW looks to do is to be that support for women photojournalists who are out there doing the work that you don't see a lot of women, you know, doing doing that kind of work. So there's everything from workshops to portfolio reviews to talks where we bring in some dynamic people who are, you know, working and doing some really great things for inspirational talks. Um, there's mentorship. And currently what we're working on is, um, you know, an initiative to bring in some resources for diversity and inclusion. So, and that was one of the things that I wanted to, in coming into WAPOW as um, president last year, was to work on something that would, you know, bring that home and to be that support for inclusive storytelling. Um, so we're based here in Washington, D.C., and this is my second and last year um, as the president of WAPOW, but I won't be leaving. I'll still be, um, you know, working with the organization. And so you recognizing the need, I mean, knowing yourself being in, you know, photographing in the white house, you know, photographing in, um, you know, you're in DC. So you're in the scene of whether it's, you know, politics or so many different things going on. Uh, can you tell us about an experience where, you personally 
recognize like things have got to change like how you know how how you led you to diversity and inclusion being sort of the thing to focus on right um well I, I see that a lot when I'm doing political work um it's almost like a constant reminder of you know why there needs to be change but specifically um I remember, so at the beginning of the um, Trump administration, I remember being at the White House in the East Room for an event where President Trump was introducing uh, Gorsuch, and, but we didn't know it was Gorsuch yet. Um, but I remember coming into the room and going back to the press area and, you know, everybody's setting up and... I just kind of pause because I'm looking around the room because I started um, I started um, doing uh, photojournalism at the White House during the second term of the Obama administration. So that was my first kind of foray into, you know, White House uh, reporting. And so to go from that to my first like big event at the White House during um, the Trump administration in the beginning of that, was this event. And so as I finished like, you know, setting up and just kind of looking around, I just had to stop and I'm looking, I was like, this looks like a white male convention. Like to me, it was like such a stark difference in terms of the audience, like the the guests that were there. Um, I think I saw Tim Scott and that was the only like face of color I saw like in the East Room during that event. And so it was just like, wow, like we have a lot, we have, you know, we've made a lot of inroads. There's been progress, but we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and not only looking at the audience, but then, you know, I'm looking around at, you know, the everybody who's there, like the press pool. And it wasn't a lot of, you know, diversity there as well, to be honest with you. So we still have a ways to go, but it also solidified to me, like, okay, we, we got to roll our sleeves up and, you know, there's, there's things to do because I don't, um, there was a saying someone said, and I can't think of who it was. Um, and this was a black, a black man. And he said, you know, it's, it's not good for me to be the first if there's not a second and if there's not a third. And so a lot of times when I go into these spaces and I'm the only one, that's not good. Like, you know, I, I want to be there to help open those doors as people like Sharon Farmer did, you know, before me, uh, that I'm able to be in those spaces, but it's gotta like get better than this. And I don't want to just come in here to be the first and the last or the first and the only. Um, so I'm just, I really want, do want to see like different lenses. I want to see different voices. I want to kind of get different pr perspectives, like just, and that to me was like a perfect example of, yeah, we got, we have some work to do. And, and, and it's one thing to like know intellectually and it's another thing to experience yeah. personally. Uh, and, and that, you know, motivating factor. What has, what, you know, what do you t talk to your students about or the, you know, WAPOW, um, the women photojournalists, what are the ways of change, the potential, you know, inroads, what are the, the biggest roadblocks that we're trying to, to work through? And what are some of the, the ways that people out there listening um, other black women photographers or, you know, anyone can, can be looking to, well, how do I get past these roadblocks? Right. Right. So there are a number of things, but I think the main things for me are, um, that are roadblocks are, um, access opportunity and, and equipment. Um, and they pretty much work together because, to get to a level where you can shoot at the White House or the Capitol, Capitol Hill, 
Um, and that's probably not a good word to say, shoot, but to photograph at the White House and Capitol Hill, um, you have to have a certain level of equipment. And it's not cheap, you know, as an independent photographer, you know, it, there's money involved in getting these camera bodies, the proper lenses, and, you know, any other equipment that you need. So that's the first kind of barrier to, you know, getting to do that work. Um, and then when I say access and opportunity, it is to, to get those assignments. So you have editors who, you know, are assigning people to, you know, for certain stories and, and things like that. So that's why it's important for organizations like WAPOW. Um, you also have Diversify Photo, uh, Black Women photo uh, Photographers, Women Photograph, Authority Collective. And um, I also have membership and work with those organizations as well because, you know, they do a lot of great work on um, advocating, um, offering, um, you know, guidance and support, um, workshops, portfolio reviews, and also um, getting gear because, you know, they'll work with companies to get gear donated so that it gets in the hands of people who, um, photographers who really need it and who don't have access to that gear or the money for it. So I think as long as you have um, people in organ who are working with organizations like WAPOW and the other organizations I listed, then that's where you're gonna start to see the, the needle move. And we've seen the needle move in this, in this current moment because of, you know, the whole Amplify Black Voices movement and, um, you know, this call to, you know, let's look at some other photographers and Black photographers to shoot these magazine covers and campaigns and different things like that. So then it was like a mad rush to, you know, reach out to, you know, Black photographers, photographers of color for these opportunities. So a lot of it is, is being in a position to your so that you're prepared, you're ready to accept those opportunities where you can just walk in once those opportunities, you know, are there. Um, so the continued mentorship, um, cause th these are things that help me, uh, mentorship, uh, workshops, conferences, um, opportunities to network, um, with editors and, you know, different publications so that, you can connect and they can see your work and what you're doing. And so then that way, you know, you can kind of, you may get some opportunities that way as well, but it's, it's, it's going to take some work on the other end. It's going to take some work on the editor's end. It's going to take some work on the publications end to think about things a little differently, to not go with the status quo and this is how we've always done it, but to actually look at, different, you know, bringing different voices to the table, you know, on that. So, you know, there's sure there's work we can do on our ends, but there's, there's work to be done on the other end. And I think, you know, if we can work together, then that's when you'll see that change. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, what you're seeing is people is, it needs to be intentional. It needs to be yeah, uh, sort of at, at this institutional level. Um, but I think identifying at, when we can identify the issues, access, you know, gear, opportunity, you know, that's where then, you know, people can, can look to provide those things and, and people that can look to find them. You talk about mentorship. Can you tell us about, you know, as, as a photography with a photographer with a long career, like what, what go back to you, Sharice in the beginning and, who was some? Who were some of your mentors, and what did they shift for you personally? Almost oh, definitely, um, and for me, that's what it takes. Is there were those who were before me that made those inroads and opened those doors, you know, that I could do the work that I do today. And there are several people that knew that I was their mentee. And then there were some people who didn't know I was their mentee. I was like their mentee from afar. You know, it's like people that you admired the work that they did and you just kind of follow their career and follow along. And 
whatever, you know, talks or books or things like that, that they had, then, you know, to check those out. But, um, I can tell you one of my, um, someone who has been with me, like from the beginning throughout is, um, Fred Watkins and Fred Watkins was, he worked for Ebony and Jet, like for a long time. He had a long career with Ebony and Jet. And then he, um, like currently he does work with ABC and some other things. Cause he's still, you know, he's still out there shooting as a photojournalist, but he dropped so many, um, nuggets that I still remember to this day that carry me through like current assignments that I'm doing and things and things like that, that just stuck through with me throughout. And he checks up on me, you know, how's it going? You know, you have any issues? So that that's been a mentor who has, you know, been there from the, from the start of when I really, really got started in photojournalism and has remained um, throughout. Uh, There are people like, and I mentioned her before, Sharon Farmer, who was the, you know, first lead white house photographer during the Clinton administration. So, you know, that was something you look at like, wow, like she's really in there, they're doing it. And that's something, what that shows you too, is that it's possible, you know? So, and, and that's what I say with, um, as being an educator, what's really important as, um, educators is you are that first line, um, example of what can be. You know, what's, what, what's possible, what students can aspire to. And, you know, you, and what I do with my students is I like to share my experiences of the work that I do, but also like any guidance or something that would help them along the way, or maybe speed bumps that I encountered, you know, maybe they don't have to go through those same things. So just as there were mentors who poured into my life and, you know, helped me get to what I'm doing now. And, you know, I'm still, still growing and still going. Um, I want to do the same. It's like you, you pay it forward. So I want to do the same thing for, you know, photographers who have, who are on their way up or, you know, came after me. So, um, Sharon Farmer, Fred Watkins, uh, there are like ancestors, um, like Theodore Gaffney, who mo- recently uh, passed, but he did like he risked his life t- to do a lot of his his work as a photographer d- um, for the um, during the Freedom Riders. Um, Gordon Parks, of course, um, Kareem Simpson, and this was someone like when I look back and I've read about her, it was her innovation that really like struck me because she, she had a project where she, um, documented Harlem life, nightlife, and she crafted her own, uh, mobile studio and she she would take it to the club and, (laughs) and do these portraits. So to me that like really stuck out, like, you know, to be innovative in getting, getting what you need or telling that story or documenting, you know, history. Um, I have Michelle Agins. Um, it's, it's so many people, um, out there. And then, you know, there are people that are my, um, my colleagues who definitely serve, you know, serve as that as well. Um, I think about, um, Mfan, um, which is the, uh, Layla and Delphine, you know, started that. Um, and there's a lot of work that they're doing to support and spotlight, um, women photographers of the African diaspora. So there are so many people for different, different reasons and different things. And that's why I tell, um, students or photographers who ask me about, um, you know, what things that, they should do if they want to, you know, if they want to do this as a career, that's one of the things for me is to look at those people who are doing work that you admire the work that they're doing and, you know, see how they're doing it and see what they're doing. But for me, it's not about copying what they're doing, but it's to, to learn, you know, those things that'll help you so you can craft your own story. 
Absolutely. And, and yeah, I mean, you just mentioned so many different um, A people, to uh, know, you know, for, to, for, for people if they haven't heard of them to, to go um, research and study, which is, you know, one of the aspects is, you know, learning the history, learning the craft. You mm -hmm. said, you know, as you talked about the, the relationships as well being so important. I did. You you mentioned MBON, and I know that um, your work that is part of a permanent exhibit um, in the African American Museum of Philadelphia is is part of that. Um, it, can you and 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 I forget the name of the the full name of the exhibit, uh, but about black masculinity, and it's all yeah. you know, female yeah. photographers. Um, it, it, can you talk a little bit about that work? Um, maybe your individual image or images that are in that, but then like the power of a full collection of photographers and narratives together. Yeah. And I think if, and I hope I'm not mistaken, but I think it's like 50 photographers that are in that exhibit or somewhere close to that. And it is the creation of who I mentioned earlier, um, Layla Amatula Baran and um, Delphine, and um, a part of Mfan. And the name of the exhibit is In Conversation um, uh, Visual Exploration of Black Visual Meditation on, on Black on Masculinity. Black masculinity. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And so, um, you know, I was just honored to um, be selected to be a part of that exhibit. And the, I have three pieces um, in that exhibit. One is um, a portrait of Michelle and Barack Obama uh, during their time at the White House. And it was like, um, I can't even remember which state visit it was. It was a state visit, so they were on the front steps of the White House um, getting ready to receive their guest. And um, it was a very kind of like intimate, playful moment where uh, Michelle Obama was fixing uh, Barack Obama's uh, bow tie, and he had this like you know this smirk on his face, and it was just like a a really like genuine like human moment you know um, that I captured with that, um, which um, you know I still like that photo today because it was just so fun. Um, the uh, another piece I have in there is um, it's a piece and it shows um, three black men. Um, in a power stance, uh, Van Jones in the front, and then we have uh, Lewis Reed and then uh, Michael um, flanked on the sides. And um, that was uh, taken um, during a, a voter a voting power campaign that I was working on with uh, the NAACP and Flo McAfee. Um, so... That one to me was like, you know, one of my favorites of, um, you know, that I um, captured during during that campaign. And then the last portrait is very, you know, like personal because it was um, it's Chad Bozeman, which we all know um, recently, right? So it's a black and white of him, and of course he's Howard University alum. So you know, a lot of us knew Chad, he was my neighbor. So, yeah. I actually, I did, um, I saw that image in your Instagram feed and um, just a, another just beautiful, quiet moment. Um, right. For, and, and the loss of such, you're going to make me cry now. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the loss of um, you know, such an incredible human being um, who touched so many people. Um, and how amazing yeah. that, that, that that's one of the images in that. That, that was, I'm, I'm so happy that that is a part of the exhibit. Yeah. Let me get you some so. tissues. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What was that? I mean, except what led you to being able to photograph Chad? Um, so that was actually part of a, he was doing, um, it was during a time where they were doing a screening of, um, um, God, excuse me. So they're doing a screening of one of his movies. <laughs> 
they did a screening of one of his movies. And so um, this was like, he played a um, young Thurgood Marshall. So it was called Marshall. And uh, this was after the movie. And it was a panel discussion. And a lot of what, if, and if people, if you were around Chad, like, he was kind of, it's almost like he was always in deep thought to me. Like it would go like in waves of, you know, the, the smile, you know, the happy side, but then it was always like he was thinking about something. It was like something always. So it was like in that he was talking about his role and the weight of, you know, playing that and wanting to, to represent it properly. And um, so that was, the mood and the feel like during then, because a lot of times, like when I'm I'm shooting something, um, photographing something, I, um, I connect to the emotion of it, whether it's what's going on at that current time, or if it's the person. So when I say my process, when I go in and before I even, you know, pull my camera out, how I just kind of look around and, and take it in, a lot of that speaks to um, that connection I'm, I want to make or I'm making, you know, when I go in there and just getting the feel for um, what's going on. So in that, with the panel discussion, it was the same thing. It was kind of, you know, I just kind of sat there for a minute, listened, look, looked around, and then I pulled out my camera. What do you, do, do you think that it's... Um something about you or um, that that allows you to create that emotional connection just kind of inherent in you and your personality? Or do, do you think that that's something that can be learned? Um, I don't know if it can be learned. I think for me, I think a lot of it is who I am. Um, and then, you know, I'm, you know, it's part of my spirituality and my beliefs and, you know, I believe in, in God and the power of prayer and, you know, things like that. So I think a lot of it is my, my thinking, you know, starts, you know, starts there. And then it's, it's me as a person, like the soul of who I am is, you know, one who connects. And, you know, with that comes great responsibility. And, you know, with that, you know, there, you, you take on a lot because already as photographers, when you're like covering an assignment or you're shooting a portrait or things like that, um, you can take on, um, you feel like the emotion and things that are going there. At least I do. Um, and this is especially important, like during this time and covering, you know, some of the uprisings and demonstrations that are going on is there's so, there's so many layers of emotion. Um, there's so much there. There's, there's, there's anger, there's sadness. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like there's a hopelessness, like what can I do? You know, is there going to be change? You know, um, then there are very like powerful emotions and moments as well. Like I know there's going to be change and I'm going to be out here and I'm going to do this until there is change. So in that, um, depending on your subject and what you're covering, um, you take all of that in. So for me, um, you know, with my beliefs and, um, you know, my spiritual connection and everything, it's a lot about, um, prayer and disconnecting like once you leave and once you come home you have to like disconnect from that because if you you take all of that in then you know it can cause you know those emotions to you know erupt in you as well so imagine that you know as you were saying before and as I was saying earlier about the whole connection as a black woman you know going out during this time so imagine it's coming like even more because not only do you have the empathy going on, but you know those things yourself. Like it's a part of you. So it's like your emotions in in combination with the emotion. So 
it's do you have do you have any tips for people as to because that's heavy it's really it heavy. Is heavy well like yeah. you said all the layers um how do you come home and make a, a switch so that you're you're not just drowning in that the heaviness of it right and so for me um that looks like prayer um that looks like um spending time with with friends and family um that looks like disconnecting from the news um not letting it just kind of play the whole day not listen to it the whole day um it looks like um spending quiet time um it looks like meditating it looks like listening to music um and just doing those things to to disconnect because you definitely have to do it if you don't then you're just going to continue to take that in and it's just going to build and build and build until it explodes so to not have that happen then you know there are things where i do need to connect to the you know my spirituality to um, disconnect um, from, you know, some of the things that are going on. So sometimes, uh, you know, I have to play catch up to what's going on in the world because I need to disconnect. So I just think it's really important to, you know, acknowledge and then uh, a, a address tools and ways because, because you feel, as you've been talking about this responsibility, uh, and yet you also have to be responsible you know, for yourself and your family and your community, you know, as well. And when you're a journalist, I can imagine, you know, you oh, wanting <laughs> wanting to stay on top of, it's hard to step away from the news, yeah. right? Like when, right. You're, when you don't want to miss an opportunity or, you know, or, yeah. or what have you. I'm, but you have, you have to make the time though. You definitely have to make the time, whether that's um, yoga, exercise, meditating, you know, spiritual life, like you have to make that time to, to, like you said, you acknowledge it, but then you have to disconnect and you have to, there has to be healing. Like you can't just like stay, um, stay in that. I was listening. I was, I was, um, not listening. I was looking this morning connected <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> uh, um, and it was interesting to me because you, you write um, in on your website, um, I love to connect with people and to tell those stories of marginalized people and issues. And then you say the hidden figures. And then on this, um, this is one of the first things that popped up today was and I have it here on my phone um, from communication arts. Photography has a huge responsibility now and always to bring hidden realities to the surface. And this was mm. a photographer named Camilla Falcas. Photography has a huge responsibility now and always to bring hidden realities to the surface. And I felt like those mm. two statements were very similar. Yeah, can, definitely. Can you talk more about um, hidden figures and and um, and your feeling of responsibility and how you approach, again, like telling those, those stories. Yeah. So for me, hidden figures is, um, it's like the nuances of exploring those people who are doing great work, but yet they don't get the accolades or, you know, sometimes people don't even hear about the work that they're doing or they don't know who they are. Um, it's just kind of like, it actually connects to what I was saying earlier in terms of those quiet, powerful. So for me, they're like quiet powerhouses um, when I speak about people. Um, but there are so many people that are doing great work um, in the community. And I just feel like those stories need to be told. Um, there's support that they need, whether financial or, you know, volunteers, um, you know, people, the word needs to get out. So people know that these resources are available. Um, so for me, it's about telling those, those stories of people who, 
are are doing these great things that um you know in consideration of when you look at everything else you hear about in the world they're quiet um for me it's about um like sometimes when i would say this happens a lot actually uh, when i'm out with my camera um maybe i'm on assignment maybe i'm just out there personally you know with it i'll have people to approach me and ask me to take their picture and a lot of times for me like i i look at that as when they come to me and what i feel is it's not so much about take my picture as it is more about see me so for me it's about um wanting to to be respected and wanting to have your voice heard um wanting to tell your story but you know, maybe you haven't had that opportunity or maybe, you know, people walk past you and, you know, didn't even pay attention. So, you know, sometimes when I'm out, like, you know, people will, will strike up a conversation and just start talking and I'll pause and I'll like sit there and talk to them or I'll, I'll take their picture. Um, and for me, it's like a lot of times they're like shocked, like, man, like you really took my picture? Like, you know, or man, like you're really talking to me or listening to me. And I think that's a lot of what we miss is that we do, it's like a sense of we do ignore people. And it's not that their issues and their stories are any less important. So for me, it's about showing that importance by putting a spotlight on it, by telling those stories. Um, and it's, for me, it's about certain things that go on that are also hidden. So it's not only the people who are hidden figures, but it's actually the, you know, what's going on, what are the issues or, you know, what are these stories that are like, you know, for lack of a better word, hidden. I, I think it's, you know, interesting that you talked about, you know, people just, people want to be seen. Um, and that, you know, we want to be seen and we want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And um, just as human, you know, human nature, um, that's a way that we connect with the world and experience love. Um, and, and so I'm curious what the difference for you is in terms of imagery and the ability to do that on top of just say a conversation or, um, you know, is, is written journalism, for example, like what is the power to you of the image itself um, in terms of that, you know, visual storytelling, um, the image over the words, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, they work in tandem. Uh, for me, as a photographer, of course, um, I'm going to feel, I'm going to see the power of that image. Um, for example, there's an image that I took, and this was during, this was at Black Lives Matter Plaza here in Washington, D.C. And it was one of the days where it was like really quiet. Um, you know, nothing was really going on. Um, and I remember sitting there and I was like, well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and go, you know, go home. You know, I think I'm done for the day. And um, I just felt like a shift. And as I'm like, I was moving to walk in the direction um, to go to my car, I see like people move, they like gravitate um, to this area. And there's this guy who's standing on top of the um, street light at the very top. And he has a bullhorn and he's talking. So I go over there. And um, I ended up going, like, right below him. Like, I walked around the crowd and went right below the, the light pole. And uh, he's, you know, he's talking with the bullhorn. And then there's, like, um, someone who's agitated um, in the crowd. And so he's, like, challenging him. He's going back, like, he doesn't even see the, the need for this, you know, why the protest. And so... The guy comes down, you know, the light pole, like really fast. <laughs> he comes down 
and he starts like talking, you know, talking to the guy, like trying to explain to him what the importance is and why. And, you know, the guy just wasn't hearing it. So they're, they're like facing each other, you know, like this talking and I'm standing like right next to them. So as the guy's getting more agitated, um, I have the choice of, you know, I think like maybe I should leave or at least like, you know, back out of this. Cause I'm like right next to them. Maybe I should leave or back out of it. Um, I ended up staying and the guy like eventually he left, he walked off and this other gentleman came up. Um, so this is, this is a, the black man that's up at the traffic light. Another black man comes over and he just hugs him like no words, you know, anything. He just hugs them. And I'm right there next to them. So I take that picture because for, for me, it's one of those quiet, powerful moments because you don't see black men as sens being sensitive or supportive or showing that. Like, you know, a lot of times and you'll see the image of being combative and violent and things like that. So for me, I know better. I know that it's not that. I know that's not the story. But to actually, the power of images to capture that and be able to show that to other people, let them see the sensitivity, let them see the support, then that that's the power of the image. Because, and I know it, and that, that goes back to me as a Black woman, like knowing all this, like how powerful this is, because... I feel it. I, you know, I've seen it. I understand it. So to be able to counter that story, you know, showing this beautiful, like sensitive moment is very powerful. So it, there's no doubt that, you know, images are powerful and, you know, they can like speak volumes. I think that story is just such a, a beautiful example of that and, and like you said, going back to the beginning of the conversation of you as a black woman photographer being able to sense and see a story in a single image that somebody else might not have understood the power of that story. Um, and it's just, what a, what a beautiful moment. And like you said, the importance of celebrating black culture or celebrating joy and love and not just telling stories about, um, the, you know, the, the, the negative aspects of everything that's going on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and my goodness, I'm just, I'm, I just looked at the clock and was like, Oh my gosh, it's already an hour. <laughs> oh, wow. That, it, it keep, didn't feel like an hour. Like, <laughs> I can keep talking really to you, Sharice. Um, mm. I, I, just so appreciate all the um, the work that you do, the uh, um, both in the the journalism and the storytelling itself, and then also that that education side. Um, because, like you said, I don't want to just be the person in the room and then be no more. But um, so powerful. What have you learned about yourself? Final question. What have you learned about yourself yeah. as an educator? Yeah. And how's that changed? Um, I think what I've learned is like, I feel like I found my purpose in as a photographer and as an educator. Um, I feel strongly that I have connected, um, you know, to that purpose of telling, telling those stories that aren't told um, to be able to um, make that connection from the White House to what's going on in the streets. Like all of it is connected. There's this intersectionality um, with politics, um, cult uh, culture, the communities, the streets, like all of it is connected. What happens in one affects the other. Um, so I feel like, I feel strongly that my purpose is to show that you know, to, to show that connection so that people can, you know, uh, be able to see that visually as an educator, I feel like, um, it's about, um, encouraging students to tell their stories and to connect to their purpose. Uh, one of the things, um, 
the very first class each semester, I ask my students um, when they do their introduction, I ask them, uh, tell me what you're passionate about. And, you know, some of them can't say at that point. They're like, you know what? I don't know. But there are students who are like, you know what? I'm passionate about, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, and they're able to stand firmly in that. So, so as an educator, what I want to do is to encourage those students who maybe don't have that yet and be able to encourage them in the things that I see that they, they're really good at or, you know, I see a spark somewhere. So I want to be that, you know, this, that kind of cheerleader or, you know, guidance that, you know, helps them to direct that and see that, you know, okay, this is, this is where it is. So, you know, look at that. And, you know, sometimes it happens where I'll have students who come back and say, you know what, like, you really helped me, you know, to really think about that. And, you know, I didn't know before, but now I know I'm going to, you know, I'm doing this and I'm going to law school because I want to, you know, so it's just different things. So it's not, even though it's a visual communications class, like, um, it's not about, you know, you know, maybe they won't go into journalism. Maybe they won't be a photojournalist. Um, but it's, it's about connecting to the soul of who you are. Going back to your sweatshirt. Mm. <laughs> it's really <laughs> your soul. Yeah. Charisse, thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, again, for everything you do. I want to read some shout outs before we sign off. Yeah. Uh, we have Story Support, who is saying HU stand up, uh, NEAC <laughs> crew in attendance, Angie Pride or Aggie Pride. Uh, we have Amanda from Vancouver. Um, we have Mike Ketkelu. Uh, we have Bernie. Um, uh, who was saying earlier, I love that you're being emotionally driven. Uh, we have uh, Mark Weston, who is joining from Australia. We have Dinesh, who is joining from India. Mm -hmm. Lee in the UK. And uh, Noelle uh, saying thank you so much. Um, so thank you, everybody, again, for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. Thank and um, everybody, you can uh, see what's playing upcoming here on Creative Live TV by scrolling down. Uh, we've got a lot going on this week. Scroll down and see what is upcoming. You can RSVP for those upcoming episodes. And then, of course, you can listen to the other episodes. I think we're up at 90 two episodes wow. of, we are, of We Are Photographers, <laughs> uh, listening to, uh, hearing and learning from people like Charisse, um, who, who have led incredible lives and continue to, and continue to, again, share their stories uh, so that you know you're not alone, creativelive.com slash podcast. Uh, and of course, you can subscribe um, to that wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, and Charisse, where can people find you, follow you, connect with you, hire you, all the things? <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, so my website is myfirstandlastname.com. And then um, all of my Instagram is my first and last name. It's all one, Charisse May. With two S's. And that's it. With two S's. Yeah. All right, everybody, highly encourage you to go, if you're not already, follow Sharice May on Instagram. Uh, as Tracy Jones put a link down below on Facebook uh, saying, be sure to check out her highlights, IGTV, and her link tree, which is loaded with additional talks and interviews, as well as a link to her website. So thank you for that, Tracy, for dropping that uh, in there. And everybody signing off for now. See you all next time. Thank you again to Sharice May. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially, we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with 5, 10, or 15 hours of great content, but now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or want to be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class.
We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, Try tuning into creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline, it's medicine. It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today.